Welcome to the Harvest of God, brought to you by Laharoi Ministries, where you'll learn what the Bible says about the nations of the Middle East. The name Laharoi is taken from the well in Genesis, where Hagar received the name of her son Ishmael from an angel of the Lord. Ishmael means the Lord has heard your affliction. Laharoi Ministries brings hope and future found in Jesus Christ to Hagar's generation and neighboring nations. Hosts Turin and Anna will now share in the series wells among the nations good evening dear listeners joining me today is the director of intercultural ministries of assemblies of god in the northern california and nevada district our very dear brother dennis Con conrad thank you so much for being here thank you sir and it's an honor to be here today it's a privilege indeed uh -huh. so uh, during today's interview with brother conrad we are going to speak about his life, uh, how he came to Christ, and the intercultural ministry, which connects many cultures together here in the United States. De dear Brother Can Conrad, could you please tell us about how you came to Christ and your early service in the house of the Lord? Sure, I have been blessed by a strong Christian heritage. Mm -hmm. My grandmother was a believer in Christ as well as my mother, and uh, though my mom married a non-Christian soldier just before World War II, he promised God during intense combat that if God brought him home safely, he would serve God. Wow. And eventually, Dad followed up on that promise, and not long after I was born, he accepted the Lord. I cannot remember a time when I did not attend Sunday services uh, during my childhood that included Sunday school and uh -huh. uh, Sunday morning worship and Sunday evening services every week. And I don't remember officially asking Christ to forgive my sins as a child, but I, I also don't remember a time when I did not know that he loved me more than I can imagine. Wow. I distinctly remember Sunday night after Sunday night services at the First Assembly of God in downtown Roseville, a building still there. And uh, that was a place where we always had uh, a concluding time in the prayer room. Mm -hmm. And I remember literally crying out to God Sunday after Sunday. I was usually one of the first to head to the prayer room and often one of the last to leave. And uh, that established for me a strong foundation in my yes. young life that carried me through the years mm -hmm. in secular college, in secular teaching, public education, and later in full-time ministry. Mm -hmm. So I was a youth pastor and, and did Christian ed directing. And, uh, of course, now I'm the director of the Assemblies of God in North Carolina, Nevada District Intercultural Ministries. I have been privileged to sit under, to answer the rest of your question, I have been privileged to sit under the teaching of some remarkable men of God who have challenged me to be a disciple of the Word yes. and to think honestly uh -huh. and to ask questions openly. And honestly, the older I get, it seems like the more questions I have. Mm -hmm. But I'm convinced that God is not threatened or even bothered by our sincere questions. Amen. We grow as we work through our questions, mm -hmm. and I encourage anyone listening to honestly search the Bible for answers to their Amen. questions. Yes. I've also benefited by watching men and women of God who touched my life. One of the men that I most admired was my father-in-law, mm -hmm. George Elrod. He was a minister called to preach as a Navy sailor in World War II, so he was contemporary with my dad. He believed and he was, that he was saved from a life that would have led him to alcoholism. Reverend Elrod was a strong teacher, and he practiced what he preached. I remember many times being in his home, and I got to know him and his family well, and he truly walked the talk. One of the things I most admired about him was his humble servant's heart and his willingness yes. to travel to small churches and he ministered both to the people and to the pastors throughout rural California and Nevada. He was welcomed and requested often in large churches, but his focus, especially in his final years, it was small churches and the pastors and wives there who sometimes felt forgotten in ministry. Mm -hmm. And then final comment I'd make for that question is my final years, uh, my later years, if you will, I've been blessed by serving alongside people of many cultures I spent five years teaching at Bible College in the islands of Fiji, and that provided me with new insight, learning to be flexible <laughs> and open to other cultural perspectives. It was a great experience, and it still is, ongoing yes. experience. Sometimes we have to accept the fact that other ways of doing or other ways of viewing things, mm -hmm. they're not wrong, they're just different. Yeah. And the grace of God can bring together people from incredibly diverse cultures 
to demonstrate the depth Mm -hmm. of the love of God. Yes. It's so wonderful when we see uh, otherwise that no none of them other nations cultures would have connected but god yeah. connects yes. uh, connects everyone together absolutely yeah so uh, please tell us about your current ministry what nations uh, do you work with currently yes as director of the intercultural ministries in the norcal nevada district uh my wife linda and i have the joy of serving ethnic or sometimes we call them second language co- mm-hmm. churches I never imagined that I would be working in a district office with the Assemblies of God. <laughs> and the journey we took to get there, it was full of unexpected turns, unplanned side trips, surprising stops along mm-hmm. the way. I met and married Linda while attending Chico State College and uh, much later returned to college twice to complete grad work and eventually earned a master's degree in education and a TESOL certificate that stands for Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages. <laughs> After being in full-time ministry, though, I, I returned to the classroom and I taught over 20 years in a Modesto mm-hmm. public school wow. where I honestly, I wondered if sometimes I had missed God and should be out pastoring somewhere. And in, during that time, Linda worked as a principal secretary mm-hmm. and for those 20 years. And then she also taught children's church before and after that. 2002, we both quit our jobs. We took early retirement from public education, mm-hmm. kind of a leap of faith, if you will. Yes. And we moved to Fiji, where we taught at the South Pacific Bible College. Mm-hmm. During that time, we were invited to, take, to teach a crash course in English and Burma or Myanmar, they call it Myanmar, uh, and we did that a couple times for the extensions program, the Asia Pacific Theological Seminary, and we've been invited back since then. Mm-hmm. Myanmar is another one of the incredible experiences I've enjoyed yeah. working with other people that has truly en- mm-hmm. enriched enriched our yeah. lives. So wow. uh, just a quick recount of how I ended up at the district office, I think the audience might be interested. Linda and I were content to live in Fiji for the rest mm-hmm. of our lives. We very much missed can't tell you how much we missed being with our granddaughters who were being born as we were in Fiji. But Fiji truly became home. We felt that when we got off the plane. It was, it was a God thing. So we were shocked when after five years teaching there, by the way, we'd come back every Christmas, so we kept in touch. But mm-hmm. after five years, the lead missionary retired, and we were told that we could retire also. I'll never forget, no one consulted us or even explained why that it was allowed for us to leave also. And I, I, I was really confused and honestly very upset with what I saw as the illogic of that decision. <laughs> but, I, but I struggled to be submissive, mm-hmm. even though I was questioned. I questioned, rather, why God would allow that to happen. But we soon learned that my father was dying of bone cancer, oh. and I was able to be back in California for his final months. I'll never forget when I first saw him, Sir he, uh, he greeted me with, Dan, I'm so glad that uh, uh, they sent you home, and it wasn't my illness that brought you back from the mission field. So it was, yeah. it was, it was God. And uh-huh. soon we, uh, uh, after his passing, rather, not soon, I wish it would have been soon. <laughs> it took a while. I was approached by Dr. Sam Huddleston of the NorCal Nevada District, the assistant superintendent. Mm-hmm. And he asked me if I would be willing to accept an appointment to the position of District Intercultural Ministries Director. Never heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> but it meant that I got to work with the very same cultures that we taught at the Bible school in Fiji. Uh-huh. <laughs> and now we live less than a mile from both of our kids and their families, so we get to see our four princesses on a regular basis. And we have more than made up for the time we missed them in Fiji. Yeah. So mm-hmm. honestly, as, again, I was able to see the, the good in what happened. And I was angry about being told to leave Fiji. Now, <laughs> hindsight, huh? now I can see that God was in control yes. and he had a better plan. Uh-huh. We don't always get to see how God works things out mm-hmm. for, th- for the good. But we know that he is a good God and all things do work together Amen. to good for those who are called. But it's according to his purpose, uh-huh. not our purpose. Not our and purpose. we get that sometimes way out of focus. Yeah. So again, we have to trust him to take us through all of life's unexpected challenges. Mm -hmm. So to get back to the main question, Linda and I have developed a love for people of other cultures. Yeah. It's God-given, and I believe he has sovereignly placed us in this position of intercultural ministry director. We truly enjoy hanging out with people from other countries. 
And as an added blessing, we have been asked by my boss, Dr. Sam, to visit it and to minister in the home countries of our ethnic churches. So we traveled to Tonga, been back to Fiji mm-hmm. once, Ta- Tonga three years ago, the islands of Samoa last year, and, and we plan to visit Ukraine and Russia next year. And we need to get to the Philippines soon. These trips probably do more for us <laughs> by expanding our awareness than, the, than we're able to do for the churches and the people we're there to yeah. visit. So quickly, what do I do as a director? of intercultural ministries. Well, the NCN district has between 90 and 100 identified ethnic churches. Many of them make up five ethnic fellowships, which means they have 10 or more churches Mm -hmm. in our district. Fijian, which is where we lived, Tongan, Samoan, the other two island cultures we taught are among the five. And then there's Slavic and Filipino. Filipino, by the way, is the largest group. And then there are churches from a dozen or so other remarkable cultures, such as East Indian, Chinese, Armenian, (laughs) Iranian, Hispanic, and like I said, a few others. The most recently targeted second language group that I'm privileged to work with now is the deaf culture that indeed has a second language and a culture of Uh its own. So since I serve as liaison between the district and our ethnic churches, my number one goal is building relationships. Mm -hmm. And with second language pastors, that sometimes can be a challenge. Yeah. But I want to be more effectively able to communicate with them, and I want them to feel free to call me with questions. Mm-hmm. I've learned that most of our ethnic pastors are very gracious. They're respectful, but they're also reluctant to speak out. And they and their congregations are then usually less likely to get involved in cross-cultural district ministry activities. Mm-hmm. So I'm there to try to nudge them along. Yeah. And as the IM director, I have the joy of assisting churches with other ethnic challenges. Three of them would be, uh, as an example, I get to help credential ministers who have come to California and have limited English skills, but they feel called to pastor in our area, but in their native languages. So I help them navigate the system that Mm -hmm. requires English skill that they don't have. And then I get to help establish new churches, which, of course, includes their working through all the unfamiliar U.S. and, who are we kidding, church bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I try to help churches. Third one I mentioned, this problem is one of my biggest challenges, to help churches connect with their second and third generation children who have been Americanized here in California Mm -hmm. schools and obviously think differently. Yeah. And as you mentioned, uh, you had the opportunity to retire early in 2002. I mean, it must have been uh, hard because, you know, you can either enjoy your life or you can <laughs> go into ministry again and serve God. How was uh, how did God lead you in that way? Oh, that's a great question, sir. Yeah. yeah. First, the audience can't see me, but they would see I have gray hair. I'm se- <laughs> 71 now, so I... I I still wonder sometimes what I'm going to be when I grow up. Oh. And I've had that attitude all my life, sir. And I, yeah. I look at life as an adventure, opportunity, hopefully, to follow God. Mm-hmm. Certainly want to serve him. And uh, uh, we talked about going to China once years and years ago when my children were young. And uh, uh, we looked into it. We had two children. And remember, China is really big on not having more than one child. So they didn't yeah. want us. Uh, so we talked about overseas ministry years ago. Uh-huh. And uh, when we went to, uh, to Fiji, like I said, it, it, it just really clicked. But, yeah, taking the early retirement means we, got, we have less income, mm-hmm. but the Lord provides. Amen. We have churches that sponsor us, friends who supported us in Fiji, and uh, uh, God blesses beyond yes. what we can imagine. Amen. And the next question uh, for us is that you work with many nations that have different cultures. Yeah, they have right. different traditions. And when they become Christians— they do not lose their na- national identity no. and their culture, which isn't uh, a bad thing. No. But sometimes, you know, our traditions, our cultures, they hinder with Christianity. <laughs> yes. They absolutely <laughs> have nothing to do with it. <laughs> so what problems do they encounter when they come to Christ? Because, you know, as we said, many cultures have pagan traditions and yeah. rituals that are strange to Christianity. Yeah, this is what I call a very fascinating topic uh-huh. Uh, it has many facets. Let me try to approach a couple of them. I, I saw in Fiji how that American missionaries brought to the islands their American influence, culture, and traditions. Uh-huh. Uh, and honestly, I think they were an attempt to follow their list of what was expected for holiness in American Christians, which we're going to discuss on our next interview. Yeah. But, but I think we're terrible at making lists of things we think 
we should do or ways we should act to appear to be Christ followers. And, and uh, it bugged me at times that I saw that so clearly in Fiji. A classic example, so you know what I mean, is, is dress style. In Fiji, it was very important for ministers and leaders to dress properly, uh-huh. especially when on the church platform for ministry. And I remember vividly sweating profusely <laughs> when I preached. <laughs> there was one time, honestly, I could wring sweat out of my tie. Uh, I was obligated to wear not only a shirt and tie, but a suit coat. And, and this was, remember, a tropical heat and in churches that none of them had air conditioning. Wow. But their island culture uh-huh. uh, had been impacted by American missionaries. Uh-huh. Their culture didn't teach them to wear layers of clothes, but missionaries <laughs> trained them to follow our American cultural standards. Yeah. So that's just a personal example that I, I chafed under while we lived there. Mm-hmm. I didn't gave, wasn't able to change it, by the way. It was pretty deeply ingrained. And here in California, as, as we work with those who have migrated from other countries, we, we watch them struggle with some of the ways things are done in our culture. For example, American communication is, especially with people like me, very direct. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm very outspoken, and, and most Americans tend to be. Yes. But many other countries, they focus more on respect and relationships and, and, and honor, and, and that means they don't confront one another like Americans do. Mm-hmm. And, of course, all the bureaucracy I mentioned a minute ago, all the government regulations are very difficult for those new to our country. Uh, and the immigrant tendency is to ignore things and quietly and graciously just maintain what they did at home. But they tend not to follow building codes or, or understand the uh, the legal yeah. liability issues uh-huh. that, that we have here in America where we're so prone to sue. So these are things that, that they struggle with. Uh, Another fun example of that would be how Californians expect people to honor time commitments Yeah, while many other cultures are on island time. <laughs> uh, I still remember vividly a, a birthday party where people who are Americans came to honor the guest who wasn't even there and ended up leaving before she arrived because they had another appointment wow. an hour before or after this starting of the party, which, of course, they assumed would allow them plenty of time to come, greet, and leave. And, and uh, the guest of honor was over an hour late, and most of the guests were even there after that. That's Fiji time. Anyway, uh, one of the uh, – these things I've mentioned are, are probably differences really at Bi- little, very little Bible significance. But the immigrant tr- Christians that I work, really most of them have not brought with them a, a, what I'd call a lot of pagan rituals. Uh, a couple I thought it would be drinking kava, which is, is grog, it's called, and it's definitely a, 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 a narcotic, and mm-hmm. cultural dancing. Those are a couple traditions that I've seen debated. Uh, yes. Samoa and, and uh, Fiji disagree on that, uh-huh. uh, as a matter of fact, but no reason to get into that. But that brings us back then to the issue really of traditional concepts of what's worldly as opposed to Christ-likeness or holiness. Uh, But I suppose one of the key problems I mentioned a minute ago that all ethnicities face is the desire of the older leaders in the church to to teach their children and grandchildren their cultural values, their traditions, and the language that they enjoyed in their past. Yes. But those born in California, like I said, they're Americanized. I I think that's a term we all understand. They communicate and think in English. They desire very much. I taught school. I know this. They want to fit in with their peers at school. They don't want to be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They have trouble then relating to or connecting with their older relatives who are more comfortable. And I understand that. With, And they want to conduct, and they do usually conduct their services in their native language. And they follow the traditions from their home nations. Yeah. So my advice that I, I'm trying to, to help them with is to openly interact with one another, mm-hmm. ask questions, share honest feelings across the generations with respect both to the old, which they're taught, but also to the young, which yes. is probably more an American tradition. Mm-hmm. Because they are the ones who are going to continue Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Yeah. And they understand this, from, but they, they, they so much want to keep the values of, yes. of, of the past. Uh-huh. And they look at America, and honestly, I see why again. We scare them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they're trying to hang on. Uh, and, but I, I try to say things like, if you want to communicate Christ's love with those you love, You've got to learn to listen yeah. and honestly share your heart. Mm-hmm. I'm listening to myself. I'm using the word honest a lot today, but that's one of my key words. That's really honest, yeah. a lot, I think, of my message and a lot of, of my experience that God mm-hmm. can handle our honesty, wants our honesty, and will help us 
if we can move forward yeah. with integrity. Mm-hmm. So anyway, this applies to not only family members within our cultures, but, but also, and this is where it gets more difficult for my visitor friends, it also applies to the world around us where mm-hmm. Christ commanded us to reach out. I try to encourage ethnic churches to use both their native language and, and English in their services so they can communicate with their children and with neighbors from diverse cultures. Yes. Uh-huh. The common language of English then and, and, and also Christ-like gestures of compassion are needed to communicate with the diverse cultures of our California society. Mm-hmm. We cannot expect others to automatically understand our perspectives and desires, even if they're based on Scripture, because they're also based on experience that we do not have in common. So my conclusion to this question is genuine communication with our kids and with those around us in our communities is crucial. Mm -hmm. Our traditional churches cannot continue doing what no longer communicates and expect to see the Lord bless those traditional efforts. They may have worked in the past, but we're not living in the past. At least we shouldn't be. Uh We need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us think outside the boxes of our past. Amen. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned Sometimes we, the, uh, the American society, gets yep. overwhelmed by uh, immigration and, you know, uh, accepting those people. How can uh, Christian Americans wow, that's a great embrace that? How can they approach that? Yeah, I, I, we've been talking about the ethnic churches that I, I, I had the privilege of working with, but I, what you just asked, Seren, is, is a powerful question for what I would call our Anglo churches. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, I, I'm limited in experience to work with the Assemblies of God, and, and we do have cross-cultural churches, uh, but so many of our churches are predominantly white faces like mine. Mm-hmm. And in our leadership, in our, in our, our church world, uh, until recently, most of the people in leadership were, uh, I use a phrase, hopefully not offensively, the good old boys. Mm-hmm. For years, they just would vote back in the same presbyters that they always had, and, and they were always white. But that's changing, and, and uh, the more we get involved, uh, people of different uh, colors, I think the more people realize that we have a command to reach the world, all, yes. all nations. Uh-huh. And, and one of the things I, I point out, if you want to have a church that is cross-cultural, hire staff or provide leadership that mm-hmm. is cross-cultural. Have people up front that are part of the team who not just talk about but model the fact that we are diverse and that the love of Christ reaches out. I mean, I can't help but think the marriage supper of the Lamb someday in heaven. We have no idea how it's going to be done, but I'm convinced there'll be many, many colors and many, many languages mm-hmm. somehow melted together in unity. Amen. And that, that, to me, we need to start working toward here on earth. Uh-huh. Because many times we think that uh, we should go out and we should uh, preach the gospel to other nations, which is amazing and great. But then we look around and Absolutely. see... All these so many nations they're and here. cultures, they're here, yeah. and they do not they do not know God, and um, I think it is very important for us to understand that we are the lights and we are the souls of this world, yes. and whoever we see next to us, we have to show them Christ's love and how compassionate, as you said, and honest honest love, you know. Yes. Yeah. Well, I still remember Seren as a child. We used to call our Sunday night services evangelistic services, but. Mm-hmm. I don't remember a lot of non-believers coming to our churches back then. Uh, yeah. And if we're going to reach our communities, we need to step out of the church four walls and get out and let people know that the love of Christ is real. Amen. And again, the second conversation we're going to have, uh, we're going to talk about how, how you become aware, I think, of, of people around yes. you rather than, than be, just be... There, there's a world out there that if we're not careful, we're going to be sucked into mm-hmm. and we're going to maintain our traditions and we're going to miss out with opportunities to show that Christ really loves people. Yeah. Amen. So um, thank you so much for being here. Unfortunately, our time has come to an end. So, dear listeners, thank you for listening to us today. And uh, you can visit our website at lahairoyministries.org. You can find great information there and find out a little more information about our ministry. And today, our guest was the, uh, Brother Dennis Conrad, and we had a blessed time together. Thank we are you. going to, Thank you. Uh, next time, we're, we will be talking about Christian world and how the Christian life of ours today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It was a delight to be with you.
We hope you were blessed with God's Word regarding the Middle East on Wells Among the Nations by Laharoy Ministries. There's hope and eternal life for all of God's nations and people. Peace can only be achieved when the good news of the gospel is shared and his followers are equipped. Laharoy Ministries has been reaching the Middle East with biblical teachings to provide the Word of God in native languages through Christian literature, sermons, and courses to help the people of the Middle East learn and stand firm. Please pray if God would have you support the efforts of Laharoy Ministries with a gift of any size. Your contribution will go directly to sharing the gospel through translated sermons and Christian literature. Be a well of living water to the Middle East. To give and to learn more about Laharoy Ministries, visit laharoyministries.org. That's L-A-H-A-I-R-O-I ministries.org. 